Okay, dann würde ich sagen, starten wir jetzt. Ähm, ich werde, bevor ich ins Englische wechsle, äh, erst noch mal kurz ein paar Sachen auf Deutsch sagen. Und zwar auch ähm, ja, das, was äh, sowieso immer gilt. Also ihr seid aktuell alle ohne ähm, Mikrofon und ohne Kamera zugeschaltet ähm, und behaltet das bitte auch so bei für die Zeit des Inputs von Frau Waldron. Und wenn es dann zur Diskussion geht, sagen wir noch mal extra Bescheid und dann habt ihr die Möglichkeit, euch mit Bild und oder Ton auch dazu zu schalten und mitzudiskutieren. Ähm, für die Leute auf YouTube geht das dann über den Live-Chat, aber das sage ich nochmal. Äh, der Vortrag wird hier auf Englisch stattfinden. Für alle Menschen, die jetzt gerade in dem Meeting sind und sich den in der simultan gedolmetschten Version auf Deutsch anhören möchten, müssen bitte unten in der Symbolleiste auf Zoom ähm, das Symbol für Dolmetschen finden, darauf klicken und dann in den deutschen Sprachkanal wechseln. Ähm, in diesem deutschen Sprachkanal wird... Ähm, das Ganze in simultan gedolmetscht auf Deutsch zu hören sein. An der Stelle schon mal ganz, ganz lieben Dank an unseren Dolmetscher Oskar, der das für uns macht. Genau, also unten das Dolmetschen-Symbol in der Leiste und dann in den deutschen Sprachkanal wechseln. Ähm, genau, und ähm, das war es, glaube ich, soweit schon von den Informationen auf Deutsch. So I'm gonna switch to English now. And um, we are really happy to welcome Dr. Ingrid Waldron in our lecture series here at University of Hildesheim. She is speaking to us live from uh, Halifax in Nova Scotia in Canada. And before she will start with her lecture, I will just shortly introduce her and her research. So Dr. Ingrid Waldron is an associate professor in the Faculty of Health at Dalhousie University, the team co-lead of the Improving the Health of People of African Descent flagship at the Healthy Populations Institute at Dalhousie, founder and executive director of the Environmental Noxiousness, Racial Inequities and Community Health Project, in short, the Enrich Project, and the co-founder of the National Anti-Environmental Racism Coalition. Dr. Waldron's research, teaching and community leadership and advocacy work are examining the health and mental health impacts of structural racism and other forms of discrimination in Black, Indigenous, immigrant, and refugee communities. Her research interests include mental illness and help seeking in Black, Indigenous, and immigrant communities, including Black women's experiences with mental illness and help seeking, the impact of COVID-19 in Black communities, intimate partner violence experienced by racially and culturally diverse older women, the impacts of climate change in Black communities, and environmental racism in Black and Indigenous communities. And now I'm going to turn over the floor to Dr. Ingrid Waldron, and I'm already very excited for the lecture. Thank you very much for the introduction and for inviting me today. Oops, can you see that? Yes, we can Great. see you. So I just want to begin uh, with uh, a quote. And this is a quote uh, from a really great report by Cosmo and Kahilani that talks about uh, environmental violence in indigenous communities in Canada. They use the term environmental violence uh, to discuss not only climate change and environmental racism, but all of the Uh, social ills that are impacting Indigenous communities in Canada. So the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women, high suicide rates, high levels of mental illness, um, resource extraction and environmental racism, of course. Uh, so it's a very inclusive term that looks at environmental violence as an outcome of harmful policies in Canada uh, that um, result from colonialism and colonial policy. So it shows very clearly uh, that uh, colonialism never ended. You know, we have the term called settler colonialism and there is a connection between colonial policies and present day policies. So in this, uh, in this uh, report, Vanessa Gray, who's a young activist in Amjingwang First Nation says, the land is our mother. So when we lose value for the land, people lose value for the women. Indigenous and Black women have been building grassroots environmental and social justice movements for decades to challenge the legal, political, and corporate agendas that sanctioned 
and enable environmental racism and other forms of colonial violence in their communities. Colonial gendered violence continues today and includes the crisis of missing and murdered Indigenous women, the displacement of Indigenous people from their lands by corporate resource extraction projects, anti-Black and anti-Indigenous police violence, and other forms of state sanctioned violence that make it difficult for Indigenous and Black peoples and women to meet their basic needs with respect to employment, income, healthcare, and other resources. Colonization and genocide are tied to the intersections of Indigenous lands and bodies. Women experience violence because they are the ones that are responsible for taking care of the land and holding it for future generations. Therefore, gendered violence that harms women specifically also harms nations, which makes it much easier to take possession of the land. For Indigenous women specifically, production and reproduction, land and life, and resistance and survival are all intimately connected. There's no separation. Therefore, the Indigenous role in fighting against environmental racism by defending their land and territory and protecting their water are acts of resistance against gendered oppression. So here's James Desmond. James Desmond is an African Nova Scotian in Lincolnville, uh, which is a historic black community. Uh, African Nova Scotians have been present in Nova Scotia for over 300 years. So they're uh, the oldest black population in Canada and they are descendants of American loyalists, uh, individuals from Sierra Leone in Africa, and also descendants of Jamaican Maroons. So that's, that's their history, their background. And when I visited James, uh, James's community in 2013, that's about a year after I started uh, the Environmental Racism Project, I, I knew that I wanted the project to be community-based and that meant that I needed to get to know the community members. I needed to develop a relationships with community members so they can tell me what their priorities are. Um, James is, was, is and was the leader at that time around environmental issues in his communities. He, he has been fighting uh, the landfill in their community since 1974. So we went down to get a sense of what the community members wanted us to do, but we also got consent from the communities to film uh, the workshops uh, that we held. And uh, we asked James how he would define environmental racism. And I like to use this definition because I think it's a very simple, clear, succinct, uh, but all encompassing definition of environmental racism. And he said, the practice has been locating industrial waste sites next to African Nova Scotian native and poor white communities, communities that don't have a base to fight back. You ask if that's environmental racism, it's environmental racism to its core. So we can unpack that a bit. And what he's saying is, is that it's about disproportionality. It's about the fact that certain communities, primarily racialized communities, in other words, non-white communities tend to be located closer to these sites. Um, but what he's saying really is that government cites toxic industries in these communities. So that's kind of telling that, that you know, there are certain communities that are seen as not having worth or value um, and are in addition to being racialized or non-white also lack economic clout, political clout and social clout. They also live in, in the case of indigenous communities on reserves, but in the case of African Nova Scotian communities in isolated, rural, out of the way communities. So the intersection of race, of socioeconomic status, of class, and of geography intersect in very specific ways to enable environmental racism. So that's basically what he's saying here. But he does say also white communities, right? There's a tendency to think that it only impacts racialized communities. Now, it does impact white communities, but certainly not as much as racialized communities. That's why we see it as an issue impacting mostly non-white communities. There is a community, I only know of one, uh, in Nova Scotia called Harriet's Field, which is a low income rural white community that has been trying to address water contamination since the 1980s. 
So that is an example of a white community that's also impacted. But you will find that the white communities that are impacted are also low income, right? So once again, it is about certainly social class, uh, socioeconomic status, um, and the inability to fight back because in many cases you lack the resources to do so. So government knows, government knows which communities lack the resources to fight back. That's why it's very convenient uh, to put it in these communities because in many ways, these are communities that are invisibilized, right? They're, they're not often heard and they certainly fight back, um, but government tends to ignore them. And it's much easier, particularly in Canada, it's much easier to ignore communities that seem out of the way or that are out of the way. So I like this definition that James uh, provides because it is the main definition of environmental racism. So in other words, environmental racism is discrimination. I'll just give you the more kind of academic um, definition. It is discrimination in the disproportionate location and greater exposure of indigenous black racialized and other marginalized communities to contamination and pollution from polluting industries and other environmentally hazardous activities. I would also say that environmental racism operates as a specific form of colonial, racialized and gendered violence in the way it impacts the bodies and well-being of indigenous and black women specifically. And how does it do that? Well, through health, right? Uh, through health in general, in terms of how it impacts indigenous and black communities in general, but there are very specific ways in which it impacts uh, black women and indigenous women. So the term that we use for disparities in health outcomes, particularly if you are a community that is located near to a hazardous site, we use the term environmental health inequities. And environmental health inequities across racial dimensions have been well documented over at least the past 20 years in Canada in the literature. And that literature shows that indigenous and racialized communities in Canada are exposed to greater health risks or health burdens compared to white communities because they are more likely to be spatially clustered around waste disposal sites and other environmental hazards. The health risks associated with contamination and pollution include cancer, and that's the most serious one, different types of cancers, but different, a lot of um, rare cancers, the community would say, uh, upper respiratory disease, like, and the asthma is, asthma is, um, is huge in many of the African Nova Scotian communities, cardiovascular disease, reproductive morbidity, including preterm births, temporary liver dysfunction and seizures, et cetera, et cetera. Studies provide evidence that the health effects of environmental racism are gendered and racialized. So here we have to look at those intersections again, right? Uh, the intersections of race and class and gender, because we know that um, uh, the impact on, on the body um, is very real and it's very specific uh, for indigenous and black women, particularly through reproductive health. So that's the area through which we understand those intersections um, and how environmental racism impacts the bodies of these women. It's primarily through reproductive health. So uh, it impacts indigenous and black women in specific ways, most notably through reproductive health issues such as infertility, miscarriages, premature births, premature menopause, reproductive system cancers, and of course an inability to produce healthy children due to compromised endocrine and immune systems while in utero. So one of the most insidious ways in which environmental racism impacts indigenous and black women is through the detrimental health effects of toxic contaminants, um, including high levels of toxins in breast milk, placenta cord blood, body fat, as well as infertility, um, miscarriages, um, premature menopause and an inability to produce healthy children, et cetera. Um, and inability to produce healthy children um, and a fear and anxiety about giving birth and having children because of a compromised environment for indigenous people specifically, um, they have a very holistic understanding of health, right? They're, they see a connection. Uh, and this is what we call indigenous epistemology, um, indigenous ecological knowledge, this understanding that the body 
is very very much connected to the land and uh, everything is connected to animals and plants and water, the earth. There's no separation. In, in Euro-Western understandings of the world, we tend to separate, right? We see these issues as separate issues. So when indigenous people say, when you desecrate the land, you desecrate my body, that's an indigenous understanding of the world that's very different. That, uh, for example, an indis industry owner who wants to put a landfill in a particular uh, community doesn't understand that there is there's going to be an impact on the body on the well-being on the spiritual well-being it's important to understand uh, environmental racism is very much connected to climate change because the same communities that are most impacted by environmental racism happen to be the communities that are also impacted by climate change so indigenous, black, and other racialized and marginalized communities in the global north and south are also disproportionately vulnerable to the climate crisis because they are more likely to be exposed to pollution and contamination from nearby industry and reside in places where they are more likely to be impacted by rising sea levels, disappearing shorelines, frequent and heavy rainfall, raging storms and floods, intense heat waves, increasing wildfire, poor air quality, higher rates of climate related diseases and other effects of climate change that hit them first and worst. So here we have, you know, the intersections again, you know, it's about gender and race and class, but it's also about where you live, right? So uh, in Canada, you know, the Northern indigenous communities will be most impacted by climate change because they live in high latitudes, right? So geography, the spatial patterning in terms of residential patterning of, of communities is also really important. So we, we need to look at all of those intersections. In addition, indigenous black and other racialized and marginalized communities are at greater risk for climate disasters because they are more likely to experience long-standing structural inequities that make it more difficult for them to escape, survive and recover from these disasters. These long-standing structural inequities include racist policies and practices such as residential segregation, unequal educational opportunities, limited opportunities for economic advancement, low income and poverty, and fragile public infrastructures such as poor quality housing. So here, this is really important. It's, it's an issue that people don't talk about enough. It's that it's not simply about the fact that environmental racism is connected to climate justice because the same communities are impacted by both issues, but it's because independent of climate justice or climate change, independent of climate change, independent of environmental racism, these are the communities, in many cases due to colonialism, that have historically been experiencing what we call structural inequities, policies and practices within our various social structures that harm these communities on the ground. And you could talk about any social structure. So when I talk about social structure, I mean education, I mean the healthcare system, I mean the immigration system, um, employment, labor, public infrastructure, including housing and transportation, et cetera, et cetera. Those are social structures. And historically in North America and in Canada, uh, specifically since that's where I'm, I am, um, the policies and practices and decision-making processes have been specifically harmful to these communities. Um, so these communities consequently um, have less access to important resources uh, like good quality housing, good quality food, good neighborhoods that are properly and fully resourced, uh, good quality education, right? They lack access to these resources that many of us take for granted. In many ways, the lack of access to those basic resources, particularly, I would say, good public infrastructure, because once again, because of where you live, in many ways, it weakens their ability to kind of withstand the climate devastation. So you've got these communities that are already dealing with longstanding structural inequities that seemingly have nothing to do with climate change. Then climate change hits and when people say that it hits them first and worst, what they're saying is, is that these communities are less equipped, less prepared because they lack access to those important resources. Um, for example, if you look at public infrastructure, they will be often in housing. 
uh, that's poor quality and that could not possibly withstand climate devastation. They live in communities, um, like in the case of Nova Scotia, Nova Scotia is completely surrounded by water, right? So they live in communities that make them much more vulnerable uh, to flooding. Uh, they're already dealing with uh, food insecurity. So when climate change hits them, it's going to compromise uh, food security in many ways. Uh, transit uh, may be, they may have less access to transit. They have less access to resources. They have less access to income. They have less access to political and economic and social clout. They have less access to the important networks, uh, people, networks of people that can assist them. So in many ways, it's very similar to environmental racism. Early and plant, you know, when I said earlier that these are communities that lack political clout, um, it's really important when we think of climate change when you don't have access to those networks, the supports that others take for granted. Those supports help you to fight back, to come back, to survive uh, from climate change. So on the back end, right, those, those long-standing inequities in many ways weaken their social fabric and make them vulnerable to climate change impacts. But on the other side, when climate change hits them, they still don't have those, the access to the resources to help them build back their communities. So, you know, when people, people have often said to me, I, I don't understand why climate change is a race issue. Why are you making it about race? And I say, well, I'm not saying that it doesn't impact all of us. Climate change is an issue for all of us. Uh, what I'm saying, what I'm talking about really is disproportionality in the same way that I'm talking about disproportionality around environmental racism. I'm saying climate change impacts every single one of us. We all have to be concerned. However, there are certain communities because of where they live. Uh, because of long-standing structural inequities, because they don't have access to certain resources, they're going to be hit by climate change worse. So just as gender uh, must be uh, central to discussions on environmental racism, the climate change narrative must also be inclusive and intersectional by focusing on how race, class, and gender intersect in ways that make indigenous and other racialized women and communities more vulnerable to climate devastation. The link between climate inequities and environmental racism in indigenous and black communities specifically is clear when we consider the role that geography plays in both these crises. Indigenous communities on reserves and in northern regions in Canada and African Nova Scotians who are disproportionately located in rural and isolated areas in Nova Scotia, a province, as I said earlier, that is almost entirely surrounded by sea, are disproportionately at risk for climate devastation resulting from, as I said earlier, rising sea levels, raging storms and floods. It is also important to point out that without the contributions of black and other racialized women to the environmental narrative, the lived experiences of those who work and live among the poor, immigrants and other racialized communities would not be accessible and their concerns and lived experiences of environmental crises would not be influential on public perception. Man calls attention to the importance of opening a dialogue around eco-womanism as a concept that describes the embodiment of black women's religious orientation and intimate relationship with the earth and as one that serves to unite the oppression suffered by women of African descent and the exploitation of the earth. These issues speak to how important it is for the climate change movement in Canada and around the world to make space for a deeper engagement with a climate justice framework that considers how race, gender, class, poverty, and other social identities intersect to disproportionately expose these communities, um, not only racialized communities, but also poor communities, women, persons with disabilities, and those living in isolated and rural areas to the impacts of climate change. In looking at the link between climate change and the legacy of slavery and colonialism, 
we come to understand that slavery brought with it a repurposing of the land, the chopping down of trees and the disruption of water systems and other ecological systems for the purpose of capitalist expansion and profit and resources for the privileged, all on the backs of black people. For indigenous people, the link between climate change and colonialism has involved the disruption and theft of indigenous land for expansion and for the extraction of gold and fossil fuels. These past decisions have implications for how black and indigenous people are impacted by climate change today. In addition, we must appreciate how ecological violence intersects with state violence for not only indigenous and black communities, but also brown, queer, trans and disabled people. In other words, in order to address the root causes of the climate crisis, the climate movement narrative must reflect the complexities of everyone's lives by highlighting how colonial systems have been upheld by racism, sexism, and ableism and other isms, uh, other forms of structural violence to shape the conditions we are now in. I wanna talk about some of the grassroots movements uh, to address environmental struggles that uh, indigenous and black women typically tend to be on the forefront of many of these uh, struggles. So there is a legacy uh, of environmental activism in indigenous communities specifically where indigenous women have long been on the front lines of grassroots movements for environmental climate and energy justice, calling attention to both the in injustices of indigenous people and the injustices they have long endured and the gender specific harms experienced by indigenous women that intersect with anti-indigenous racism and manifest within colonial and heteropatriarchal and sexist societies. Grassroots social and environmental justice, justice movements led by indigenous black and other racialized women must be centered around the impacts of violence, not only on women's bodies, but also on women's autonomy, women's dispossession, and on women's labor, particularly since white middle-class feminism has marginalized the leadership of black and indigenous women. Anti-capitalist and anti-colonial organizing led by indigenous and black women emerged out of histories of women's activism to challenge forms of gendered colonialism and racism that function in specific ways for indigenous and black women. Female-led indigenous and black organizing and resistance against social and environmental injustices are therefore premised on an anti-colonial feminist politics, which is a political, social, and cultural theory and movement focused on transformative change through actions to combat gender discrimination, the erasure and marginalization of indigenous black and other racialized women, and the repudiation of patriarchy, white supremacy, and colonialism within mainstream white feminism. I now want to talk about my Enrich project and what I've been doing over the past uh, nine years uh, to address uh, environmental uh, racism. Um, this project came to me, um, it was kind of given to me by an environmental activist. I, I The way this evolved continues to be kind of strange because I didn't ask for this project. And when it was brought to me, I'd never heard of the term environmental racism. And I had certainly not been engaged in any work on the environment. It was the furthest thing from my mind. Uh, my doctoral work, my postdoctoral work had nothing to do with this topic. So the only thing I can think of right now is that perhaps this project came to me for a reason <laughs> because it makes no sense that it came to somebody like myself uh, who had absolutely no experience in this um, in this topic. Uh, I, I was hesitant to take it on because I'm not an environmental scientist and I can't um, tell you anything about pollutants and contaminants. So if you're planning to ask me questions about those issues, I can't answer those because that's not my training. Um, but I did recognize that I can, I can do something with this project that eventually I realized that I don't have to be an environmental scientist to do this. I am a sociologist and a sociologist of race and ethnicity. Uh, I had long been interested in community-based research 
I had long been interested, of course, in, in race and black communities, indigenous communities. So I said to myself, well, as a sociologist of race, yes, I can bring something to this because I can talk about colonialism and capitalism and all the things that sociologists like to talk about. So I hesitantly said yes. And I started the project in, uh, 20, in 2012, um, in the spring of 2012. Um, I knew, as I said earlier, that I needed to meet communities. And I, you know, as you saw earlier, I, I drove down to Lincolnville and I met James Desmond and I, I met with four or five other communities between 2013 and 2014, just to get to know the communities and to get a sense of priorities and what I should uh, be doing. And one of the things I thought was important uh, was um, just kind of creating awareness about environmental racism, because when I started the project, I... The question I got asked the most by journalists and members of the public is, what is what's environmental racism? I've never heard of this. And there are people who were very doubtful about the reality of it, and people still are, um, because they, they hadn't really gotten the academic, perhaps academic definition of what environmental racism was. So I thought it was important for me, and I continue to do it, to organize talks and you know, other public engagement events and speak often and accept invitations to do talks because in order to get people to become empathic around this particular issue, they have to understand it. And I do understand why people were doubtful because it sounds strange. And I thought it was strange when the person who brought this to me said, it's about environmental racism. And I thought immediately, how can the environment be racist? The environment is not a person. I don't get it. It's a catchy concept and it makes a lot of sense to me now, but I don't blame the people who said to me, huh, environmental racism, that doesn't make any sense because how can the environment be racist? And as I continue to investigate it more, I realized, yes, it's a catchy term, but what it really means is that environmental policies can be racist, just like any policy. I talked earlier about structural inequities and that these are the communities that have faced longstanding structural inequities. And I talked about policies and decision making. Well, you know, the spatial patterning of industry primarily in racialized communities, which is environmental racism, is an outcome of environmental policy, right? People make those decisions, they make those policies. People of a certain race, I should add, and people of a certain social class, so there lies the problem, right? So uh, trying to unpack that uh, during many of these uh, public engagement events was really important but also bringing together, um, which I continue to do, bringing together both communities. To a certain extent, Nova Scotia is very segregated. So if you go to a public engagement event and it's about indigenous people, it's you're not gonna see a lot of um, racial, other racialized people in the audience. And if you go to a public engagement event on African Nova Scotians, the audience will be primarily filled with African Nova Scotians, other black people and some white people. And I said to myself, well, I'm looking at both communities and I don't want my events to be segregated. I wanna make sure that my speakers are from both communities and, and every, every, um, every event I organize has both communities and consequently the audience is very mixed and it's from both communities. So I wanted to do that, but I also wanted to do which everybody does. Of course, you want people with different perspectives. You want government people to stand up there and give a perspective on policy and you want members of the community always, and you want a health professional. Um, so I always, uh, because I, I'm a sociologist who's interested in health, and of course the environment, I want my events to be very interdisciplinary and multi-sectoral, bringing together people with different perspectives from different professions who can give a, look at it from a different angle. So I continue to do that. So this is an event I held here uh, in 2015 at the Halifax central library um that was you know it was educational but also allow you know allow people to hear about this topic for the first time and also kind of brought people to me in the form of volunteers you know what typically people attend my events and they get very excited uh, it's a topic that some people don't know anything about but they want to find a way to help and ultimately what happens is that i get a phone call the next day and people want to volunteer which is extremely helpful to me during those times when maybe I don't have a grant. Uh, so this is one of my favorite, or probably my favorite event that I held that you're looking at here. I also, of course, have to write. I'm an academic, I'm a professor, and you know that's part of my job. But more importantly, 
policymakers want data. You know, if I'm going to impress upon Nova Scotia environment, the Department of Environment in Nova Scotia, they want, they want data. And when I first met with them back in 2013, when I had just started the project, I hadn't written anything at that point. You know, that's what they said to me, where's your data? You know, you claim that this is a health issue. You claim that these communities uh, have cancer. Where's your data? And I couldn't give them any because I had just started. So this book came out in 2018. Um, there's something in the water and it documents the long history of environmental racism, uh, not just in Nova Scotia, but across Canada. And I also talk about the United States. I talk specifically about uh, Flint, Michigan. You probably heard about the Flint water crisis. We heard a lot about that back in 2014, low income African Nova Scotian community, also mixed community. So some white uh, people as well in that community who were low income and they turned on their tap and they saw brown water and right. So that was a big uh, story back in 2014. So I talk about the United States, of course, but I document the long history of environmental racism in uh, Canada over the past 70 years, to be honest with you. Uh, it's been a long time. I also talk about the health impacts in chapter five. I talk exclusively about health and the need to look at the full social context to understand health inequities. In other words, it's not simply about behavior, right? It's also about those long-standing structural inequities that actually intersect with pollution to compromise the health and well-being of communities. Um, I talk about policing. I talk about child welfare. I talk about all the kind of other social ills that both communities are facing because they help to compromise the well-being, the social well-being, economic well-being of these communities. And you can't really talk about environmental racism without talking about all the other social ills because those social ills actually um, weaken the fabric, the social fabric of these communities, which actually enables environmental racism. And it allows people to come into people's community because they're in a way weakened by some of these social ills and to come into these communities um, and impose themselves upon these communities. And when these communities fight back, which is often very difficult, um, they often lose, right? Uh, their concerns are uh, in many ways um, not uh, taken seriously. So I thought it was important to look at the full social context of these communities to show that, well, they compromise the social fabric of these communities, which thereby enables environmental racism. And ma environmental racism manifests out of not simply pollutants, but manifest out of all those socioeconomic political weaknesses that these communities endure. This map is also very important because it's, it's, it shows, it's visible, it shows, it maps the location of industries in indigenous and black communities. So when this map came out, a lot of the doubters were no longer doubters. Uh, you know, they sent me an email and they said, okay, yeah, I can see it. So what this shows on my website, so this is just a photo for you, but if you go onto my website, you'll see a map with two layers, one layer with indigenous communities and one layer with African and Scotian communities. And it shows the pulp and paper mills, the incinerators, the landfills, other sites that are close to these communities. What it doesn't say is that white communities are not near these sites, of course they are, um, but it's disproportionately black and indigenous communities that are near these sites. And to me, just, the, just this map is kind of overwhelming evidence um, that this is real. And there will continue to be people in Canada who say that it's not, but that's probably because they don't want it to be real. But the evidence is right here. And this, uh, along with my book and along with research published by other people is, um, you know, it's, it's um, information that I can bring to policymakers in my toolkit, you know, toolkit of different tools that I have to provide evidence for the reality of this particular topic. While this um, NGO called Rural Water Watch is not a part of the Enrich project, it evolved out of my project. So I showed you earlier the, um, the, the event that I held, uh, this was in 2015, and sitting in the audience at that event was uh, Fred Bonner. Fred Bonner is a hydrogeologist. And he attended that event and he called me up the day after and he said, I really loved your event, but have you ever thought of doing something tangible for the communities? I know you're working on policy and legislation and 
I know you're doing research and you're writing and all that's great, you know, but what about something more tangible to give these communities a win so that they can really be invested in your project? And I said, well, it sounds great, but I, I am not an environmental scientist and I wouldn't know how to do what you're suggesting. He said, well, I'm a hydrogeologist and I'd be happy to work with you and form a, a working group to perhaps test water. Why don't we test water? If the community's concern is that they have contaminated water and they're worried about getting ill, then a really tangible way we can help them is testing their water. So as part of the Enrich project initially, we formed a working group comprised of Fred Bonner, who's the hydrogeologist, another environmental scientist, an environmental science student in another province and community members. And we set about conducting a water testing project in Lincolnville. If you remember, you saw James Desmond in the photo earlier. So his community, we decided we would do a water testing project. And that was October of 2016. And it worked out really well. We did the water testing project. We did a final report. We went back to the community. We shared the findings. We also told that, um, we also informed them about how to keep their well healthy, right? So rural communities tend to be on well water. Well water tends to be contaminated and then there are risks in terms of health. So we try to educate them about all those issues. And we said to ourselves, this worked really well. This is a really good blueprint. It's a template for something more. And in 2017, we decided that that blueprint would turn into an NGO, a non-governmental organization. So we formed a non-governmental organization um, that year in 2017. And we then conducted another water testing project in Shelburne, which is uh, another black uh, community. So we continue to do that work right now. We now um, organize an annual Healthy Wells Day. And we do that work online, in person. So we collect samples, water samples, and we conduct water testing in communities. But we also create awareness through social media. You know, we post infographics and different posters to educate the public on social media, Twitter specifically, and uh, our Facebook page to just create awareness about the need to um, keep your wells healthy. You know, if you have a cracked well or you haven't replaced your well, you've had a well for 20 years, then you're at risk for serious health issues. So uh, that's new. And we started that annual awareness program uh, on October 18th of last year. I also consulted with EcoJustice. EcoJustice is a Canadian law charity. Um, I first connected with them in 2016 on behalf of Lincolnville, the black community that James Desmond belongs to. Um, I wanted to fight, figure out if they can help the community in terms of, you know, looking at legal remedies. Many of these communities, particularly the black communities have said, we want reparations. We want financial compensation for the fallout of this landfill in our community, because now that we have this landfill, people don't want to build homes in our community. People don't want to open up businesses. And because of that, there's an economic fallout. In addition, the young people have moved out of Lincolnville. So it's a very much an elderly community, but the elderly community is not in the workforce, right? So that actually destabilizes the community, of course, economically. So they feel in, for many reasons, there has been an economic fallout. So they have asked for reparation. So there's no precedence for that in, in Canada, I believe, and that's probably highly unlikely. But I've looked, I've, you know, I've reached out to Eco Justice and, you know, trying to figure out are there legal remedies that that would be great if they can get reparations, but other legal remedies would also be ideal. Uh, so they're working, they continue to work with the communities that I'm working with to look at legal remedies and how they can address environmental racism in different ways. I'm also looking to do more in the school system. I recognize that the reason why we continue to make this mistake or the government continues to make this mistake and the reason why environmental racism continues year after year, decade after decade in Canada, right now over 70 years, right? The first case I can think about was Shelburne, 1943, a landfill was placed there. Is because I think our government officials don't get it, just to be blunt. Uh, they don't have the right analysis and that's because they, you know, Nova Scotia, our school system, the high school system, middle school system does not teach about systemic racism. They don't really teach about environmental racism. 
right? So the young people in our school system obviously are our future leaders. So how do we get to them? How do we provide them with a different analysis and a different framework? An analysis and a framework that our current leaders do not have for the most part, because when they went to school, they weren't teaching about these issues. So in a way, no fault of their own, although I think many of them understand what they are doing. So I do think I do hold them accountable. Uh, but many of us have not had the benefit of learning about systemic racism and environmental racism being an example of that in our school system. So for me, the root of the problem is education. So I'm working with this, these two young women who are Dalhousie graduates. Uh, they're from an organization called Let's Sprout um, to change, hopefully, the school curricula, the high school curricula and the middle school curricula. Our first step, however, is to create innovative and creative resources for teachers to use in the classroom to teach about environmental racism. And those creative resources could include poetry, music, graphic art, painting, short stories, anything that's creative, because we know that young people like to learn in different ways and in many cases in very creative ways. Uh, so it's about creating those tools for teachers to use in the classroom to teach about this information, to teach about environmental racism. It's also about getting teachers more comfortable talking about touchy subjects or sensitive subjects. But in the long term, it's about how do we get this information into the curricula in more permanent ways? How do we get teachers talking about racism and environmental racism being one example of that? So that's much more long term. And uh, we started the project in 2019 and then COVID hit uh, Nova Scotia March uh, 14th of 2020. So we were kind of halted. It was kind of halted this project um, because it, it required us to actually go down to the communities, to the indigenous community and hear what they want, right? Not just to go ahead and do it, but to hear what do you want to see in the curriculum? So um, we, once it's no longer, and COVID is not a huge problem in Nova Scotia as it is in other parts of Canada. We have very few cases, but at some point we're going to start this, this project back up because I think it's really important. I also started to get more into kind of uh, addressing climate change in much more practical ways. Of course, I have the analysis. You know, I talked to you earlier about the climate justice analysis, but doing something tangible in a community in Nova Scotia. I had yet to do that until I was contacted in late 2019 by retired climate scientists. And they said, we would like to do something in the African Nova Scotia community. We would like to do something around climate change adaptation. And I said, that's great, but you're gonna, you, you have to know that this community is largely not that engaged in this topic. And in order to make it meaningful, it has to come from their perspective. You can't go in talking about greenhouse gas emissions. And that doesn't mean that they don't understand that. It just means that I think people in general just turn off when they hear. And I know it's important, but they turn off when they hear that because they say to themselves, what does that have to do with me? So I said to them, if you're going to do this, you have to do it in a way that makes people think, OK, what does that have to do with me? What does that have to do with my family? What does that have to do with my community? If it's not meaningful to me, if you're talking about climate change and I don't see how it connects to me, my family and my community, then it's not really relevant to me right now because I've got other priorities like poverty and food security and I have other priorities trying to feed my family and put food on their face that I don't want to hear about climate change, right? Unless you make it personal. So I said to them, you must make it personal. And they did. And we looked at the social, economic and health impacts from the perspectives of those communities and the weaknesses, the things that they don't have, the resources that they lack that would make it very difficult for them to engage in climate change adaptation the networks that they may not have, the people, the scientists, um, the government people who may not be supportive, right? Those are real um, weaknesses in communities, things that they don't have access to, particularly if they're racialized and they're low income and they live in rural areas, they're not gonna have these things. So you can tell them all day long, you should do this and you should do that. But if they don't have access to certain things, then they can't do it. So that's the, that's the approach that we took. The project was completed at the end of March and we did produce a final report that was shared with the community. And we're looking to do a follow-up workshop either with the same people or to go to other communities. I also train students, of course, um, like any professor, you know, we train and mentor students. But what I have found over the years with this topic of environmental racism is how interdisciplinary it is. 
And I didn't realize that early on. Uh, it's only when students from so many different departments at Dalhousie at my university started to come to me to say, I'd like to volunteer, I'd like to help out, I'd like to do an internship, I'd like to... And I started realizing that they were coming from so many different departments, like sociology, environmental science, environmental studies, planning, geography, medicine, other health professions, the law school, uh, political science, et cetera, et cetera. I was like, wow, you know, the students in so many different disciplines have an interest in this. And I understood why, you know, as the political science students are interested in the policy and the law students are interested in the policy and legislation and the health students, of course, are interested in health disparities and, the you know, it's obvious why the environmental science students would be interested in this, but it was, it's been thrilling to see, you know, to, to, to get a sense that people have a stake in this particular topic and they see themselves in the topic uh, in so many ways across disciplines and also faculty as well. So for me, it's been really interesting exciting and I've learned a lot from students and faculty in different disciplines and you know obviously I there are gaps in my knowledge as I said I don't know anything about pollution but that's the whole point of partnerships is to fill in the gaps right the whole point of partnerships is that you have I bring a certain expertise but if there's there's a expertise that I don't have you bring in people to fill that gap and my project my enriched project has continued on for the past nine years because I've been open to engaging people uh, with different skills and different in different disciplines in different professions and it keeps it exciting for me. I also use multimedia I continue as I said earlier I do speak to journalists a lot I do radio a lot television. Um, newspapers magazines uh, podcasts you name it. Um, I, I have to say that over the past few years, I'm, I'm, I'm sought out a lot by journalists. They think this topic of environmental racism is very interesting. They want to hear more about it. Um, so I'm in a really good position in terms of it, 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 it's a niche. It's kind of a niche topic, but then it's not because in Canada, it's becoming much more popular, but people are very intrigued. So they want to know more and then they find me on the internet and they ultimately contact me. So this is something that I continue to do because I know there's always going to be somebody who doesn't understand it. And if I want to mobilize people, as I said earlier, people have to understand an issue in order to feel empathic. And once you feel empathic, then you're incited to action, right? So education continues to be important. And here's Elliot Page. Um, when I talk about multimedia, well, of course, Netflix, um, is multimedia the highest kind of level of knowledge translation that you can get, right? As academics, we talk all the time about knowledge translation. How do we get our work out there? How do we get our results out there, right? In order for it to have some kind of impact, positive impact. In late 2018, Elliot Page contacted me, no, didn't contact me, um, was tweeting about my book on my Twitter page for the Enrich Project. That's it. I woke up and I noticed that that page was very active and I traced it back to Elliot, but didn't, it didn't dawn on me that it was the actor who I had seen in several movies. It just didn't dawn on me. So I just kind of went about my business and three weeks later, I, I went back to that Twitter page and there was much more activity at that time. And I was like, who, who's doing this? Who's promoting my book? And I traced it back up to the same Elliot page. I was like, oh, that's that person that I noticed was a new follower on my Twitter page. Huh. I said, I guess it is the actor. And I realized that it, it had to be, right? There was, no other, um, there was no other person it could be. So I reached out, I DM'd him and thanked him. And then uh, we arranged a phone call at the end of 2018 and the beginning of 2019. And eventually after many conversations, this wasn't our first plan, we decided on a documentary and it went to um, the Toronto International Film Festival in September of 2019 and here we are in Toronto posing on the red carpet we spoke to you know tons of media of course and once again more knowledge mobilization right we spoke to American media Canadian media and got kind of the word out of it you know the word out about what's happening in Canada and what's happening in Nova Scotia specifically a lot of people were shocked you know because people think Canada not that it isn't, but Canada is just, and Canada is a place where you can look to for human rights, and all that is true to a certain extent. 
and there's no racism in Canada and all these myths that people have about Canada. So they were shocked, uh, particularly the Americans. Can't believe it's happening in Canada. And I said, yeah, just like it's happening in the United States. Uh, we have racism here, yes. <laughs> Uh, so it was really great running around to different media and getting the word out. Um, and later, of course, it went to Netflix. It started streaming on Netflix uh, March 29th of last year. And that brought more um, conversation, you know, and people reached out to me from around the world, um, letting me know that the women in the film, the Indigenous and Black women in the film, have inspired them. And that really made me feel great because I, I, I wasn't really thinking about that when I, when I, Co-produced. I was asked to co-produce the film. I was thinking, okay, we just need people to know about what's happening in Nova Scotia, but it has really inspired people. Um, I think you, you see women in the film who lack resources, who are low income, who don't have political and economic clout, but yet are still doing huge things in their community. And that's what I take away from it, that even if you don't have political, and even though it's taking a long time, and it is taking a long time for them to, to, you know, to address the issue, you still see women on the front lines who are powerful. And I think it's a really important message for everybody, but for young uh, women, for indigenous people specifically and black people specifically to see great role models on the screen. I'm also very much interested in legislation. Back in 2015, I created legislation in partnership with Lenore Zan. Lenore is originally from Australia, um, but has been in Nova Scotia for most of her life. She was an actress, actually, and acted on the stage and in movies. And uh, I think for about 15 years now has been a politician. And in 2015, we met for coffee at Starbucks. And uh, I said, I just want to get some information from you or some ideas about how I can address environmental racism. And she proposed the idea of developing a private member's bill. I didn't. I wasn't even thinking that far. And she said, we can, we can develop a private member's bill, but I should caution you that those bills never pass into legislation or law. What it does do well is it can promote the issue. It can get, it can get attention for the issue. We can be in all the newspapers. We can do a press conference and everybody's gonna be talking about environmental racism. And she was right. Everything she said was right. It never did become legislation. That was bill, that was bill 111, an act to address environmental racism. So it never did become environment, uh, environmental legislation, even though she introduced it every year, but it did get us a lot of attention and she was right. It got into all the newspapers and people started talking about environmental racism more. And at that point, I would say that people stopped kind of in Nova Scotia asking me, what's environmental racism, right? Uh, in Nova Scotia, people pretty much get it. So, um, it never became legislation, it was disappointing, but last year in February, uh, Lenore approached me by email and she said, um, I'm thinking of turning Bill 111 into a federal bill and we can introduce it in the House of Commons. What do you think about that? I said, this is great. This is a national Canadian private members bill now. The first one back in 2015 was Nova Scotia, you know, and now we can actually address environmental racism across Canada. I said, yes, please. I think this is a great idea. So she showed me what she had drafted. I provided my comments and my feedback and she introduced it in the House of Commons in Ottawa um, on February 26th of last year. And then it went to second reading at the House of Commons, December 8th of last year. That was the first hour of the debate. And then the second hour of the debate was on March 23rd of this year. And then we found out on March 24th that it was approved, which has never happened. It was approved at second reading. Now that doesn't mean it's legislation. It has to go to third reading and then law amendments and then maybe another stage. But this is a victory in a way, a very small victory because we tried to do this with the provincial bill and it never was approved at second reading, it stalled. So this for me is an achievement even though it has yet to become legislation. I spoke to the bill last week, I gave a speech. Uh, last week, I think it was Tuesday, just to support Lenore. Um, right now it's at the Environment Committee and they're making a decision about whether or not it needs to be amended in any way. And if it passes that stage, then I think it goes to third reading. So I'm very, very excited that the bill has reached this stage and I am working with my coalition. I, I formed a coalition to support, to figure out how we can support the bill at every phase. And I just mentioned the coalition. So I have a new coalition. 
a national anti-environmental racism coalition that I co-founded with Naolo Charles. He's originally from the Ivory Coast in Africa, and he's in Toronto right now. And he emailed me uh, July of last year, and he said, have you ever thought of doing your environmental racism project more broadly to look at cases across Canada, not just Nova Scotia? And I said, yeah, I've always wanted to do that, but it wasn't the right time. He said, well, I'm interested in doing that. And we decided to form a national coalition that would bring together, which has brought together over 50 uh, organizations in the environmental and climate change sectors to work together to share resources, expertise, and skills with the ultimate goal of addressing cases of environmental racism and climate change devastation uh, in Indigenous Black communities, but also immigrant communities, urban communities, rural communities across Canada. We do our work through six working groups, the communications working group, the research and mapping working group, the education and training working group, the campaigns working group, um, the youth leadership working group. I believe that's all, unless there's another one. The campaigns working group specifically is supporting Bill C-230 and other bills. Uh, so it's been really great to bring together these organizations and even doing the work within those working groups has been really key uh, because everybody has a role to play. Um, and we have like people invested in doing that work from across the country. And I really believe that the fact that we were approved at second reading for the bill has a lot to do with the ways in which people came together, specifically in the campaigns working group uh, to support the bill, you know, through tweets and you know, meetings with politicians, I really believe that uh, the coalition uh, had a huge role to play in the approval of the bill at second reading. So we want to kind of continue to model what we did uh, to kind of to, 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 to realize other wins around environmental racism and climate change. I'm also a part of a new, uh, another coalition called the Environmental Rights Coalition. You probably are aware of this in here in Germany, um, many countries around the world have a legal right to a healthy environment, but Canada doesn't for some strange reason. Um, the David Suzuki Foundation has been trying to support this work for years, but Canada still doesn't have a legal right uh, to a healthy environment. So this coalition is about looking at that. Um, it, we brought together people in different organizations to collaborate, to secure the legal rights to a healthy environment in Canada and in securing that what we call a human right, that's a human right, our aim is to establish accessible and practical legal tools that can be used to, uh, by all to fight environmental injustices and ensure equal access uh, to environmental health. So that's where I'm at right now. And that's the conclusion of my presentation in terms of an overview of what I've been doing over the past several years. Um, thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you very much for this really, really interesting lecture. I really enjoyed it personally. Um, so now we still have some time for any questions or um, yeah, anything you just want to say or any feedback you want to give. And uh, we are going to do it in the way that um, you can either do it in English um, so that you just um, put your name in the chat and then I'm going to tell you that you can speak up. And you can just ask a question to Dr. Waldron, or if you're more comfortable doing it in German, uh, you can also just put your name in the chat. And it would be nice if you just um, type something like uh, Frage auf Deutsch, so like question in German or something, so that our translator Oscar knows that he has to translate the question to Dr. Waldron. Um, and if you're on YouTube, you can just post the question in the live chat just right next to the um, next to the video, and then we can also ask it to Dr. Walton. Okay, so I just said we're gonna wait a few moments if anything comes up. Yes, Ida has a question. Yeah, hi, I have a question. Um, I recently learned about the GI Bill and um, the redlining in the USA. And I just wanted to ask if there is something uh, similar in Canada. 
redlining in terms of housing in the United States? Yeah, or well, just some policies that um, give some communities a very big disadvantage. We don't have a policy like redlining in the United States, but I would say that, I always say that um, place and space and neighborhood is one of the most significant determinants of health. And so where you live determines access to many things, access to transportation, access to healthy foods, access to green space and recreation, et cetera. So I think it's one of the most important determinants of health. In Nova Scotia and Canada, it's quite clear, um, particularly in places like Toronto, but also in Halifax, quite clear that there are policies that result in certain communities living in areas that are less well resourced. Um, and there are two things happening. It's communities that are segregated in terms of socioeconomic status and race, but also there's the reality of gentrification or what we call urban renewal in Canada. So the, the history of that isn't as deep as in the United States, but we do have communities, I will take, um, I'll take Halifax for instance, where there's a high proportion of low income racialized African, Nova Scotian for example, and immigrant communities located in areas that don't have access to good and reliable transportation, uh, don't have access to green space, uh, don't have access to enough health care, don't have access to healthy food stores. Um, and the community that I'm thinking about, for example, is the north end of Halifax that for the past 10 years has been undergoing gentrification or what we call urban renewal. And what has resulted is that uh, the, the black community specifically that is a historic black community, I mentioned that they're, they've been in Nova Scotia for over 300 years, they have been pushed out of that community because that community now has expensive high rise condos and businesses and restaurants that they are not able to frequent because they're low income. So that community has had to find other places to live. I see that as a policy issue. And I see that as slightly purposeful, right? It's a, it's a structural inequity, but structural inequities are subtle and they're systemic. Um, and policymakers create those policies. So I do believe that it's kind of a way to get people out and because that area is a stigmatized area, it's seen or it used to be viewed as an area with a lot of crime, with black people, with crime, with drugs, right? So when I first came to Halifax from Toronto, a landlord said to me, you don't wanna live in the North End. And I didn't know what she meant because I didn't know anybody here and I didn't know Halifax very well. And then as I continued to live here, I was like, oh, okay. It's, she's talking about the area with black people and she's assuming, well, there's guns there and drugs there, right? So. I believe that there was an effort to clean out uh, the North End, and th these are community members who have had to go to other areas. When we go back to Africville, which is an example of environmental racism in Canada and gentrification, Africville was a com Black community um, that was pushed out of their community in the mid-1960s. Uh, it was a thriving community in terms of strong social networks, but Halifax wanted to um, they were involved in industrial development and they wanted the community, community out of that area to make way for development. The community was pushed out of that area. They were actually pushed out using dump trucks. Their church was burned down as a way to get them out of there. Um, and now they suffer the consequences. They've actually been many of them pushed into the North End in a lower income area of the North End called Uniac Square, which has social housing. These are... Um, these are issues that are a result of policy, similar to environmental racism. And some people would say this is an example of environmental racism, an urban form of environmental racism. In Toronto, where this is happening as well, they would say, well, Ingrid, you talk a lot about rural environmental racism, environmental racism that happens in rural communities. That's the case. That's a classic example, I guess, in many cases. But in Toronto, they would say that gentrification, pushing people out of their communities, et cetera, is another type of environmental racism because it's about the environment, it's about place, it's about space. So bringing what I'm saying back to the issue of space and place, I think where you live and of course your race and your economic status have bearing on 
on your on residential patterns and that has everything to do with the policies that are created and the decision makers and who's in power and who gets to make policy right it has everything to do with who gets to make policy and in canada and around the world the people who get to make policies are those who are white and from the upper or middle class right and the policies that you make are often inscribed with racial meaning the views and perceptions that you have about people about racialized people, about who's superior and who's inferior, to put it bluntly, about who has worth and who doesn't have worth, who has value and who doesn't have value. If you think those perceptions don't get written into policy, you know, we talk about sub, um, unconscious bias. If you think they don't, then <laughs> I got news for you, they do, right? So our views about people get written into policy. So in many ways, it's purposeful. So we don't have redlining per se, but what I described to you is very much an example of that. Thank you a lot. Okay, so the next question is from Svanche. Yes, hello. Also, thank you a lot for this presentation. It was really interesting. Um, I don't know if the Zapatista movement in Mexico is well known or if you know something about it, but um, I heard about this movement maybe one year ago, and I just know that the Mexican government took away uh, the land of these indigenous communities and groups, and they um, fight back with weapons, so with violence, but he, the, the community and in, the indigenous community won, and they took back the land, and now they have like little I feel like a little democracy in Mexico, like they have their own school system and so on. And I wanted to know, like, if um, violence, like weapons, is a chance or the only chance for um, discriminated groups to, to win? Or is there a chance, like, to do it a more nicer way without weapons? But, yeah, maybe you know something about it. Well, I guess it depends on the cultural context. I mean, in Canada, that's not the norm. And I know it is not the only way uh, to win. The indigenous communities in Canada engage in what we call civil disobedience, right? That's how they've um, dealt with environmental racism and other issues that are connected to environmental racism is through civil disobedience, educating allies, um, marches, marches, protests, letter signing, sit-ins, you know, the typical things that people have done down through generations in order to resist. But I would also say that it can lead to success because I can give an example of one victory. Um, it would be nice to have more, but in Nova Scotia, uh, Peak Two Landing First Nation, which is featured in my film, the Boat Harbor site, which has been contaminated since 1967, that's a community that has been asking government to address their issues since, I would say, the mid-1980s, right? So this is Boat Harbor in Pictou Landing First Nation, an indigenous community, and a pulp mill has been dumping effluent into Boat Harbor since 1967. And then around the 80s, the community started to uh, uh, resist the, this, uh, this landfill. There were broken promises by the government. The government in Nova Scotia kept saying, we're gonna address it, it's gonna close. The pulp and paper, the mill is gonna close, it's gonna close, and these were broken promises. And the, over the years, the community has engaged in all the things I mentioned, you know, so different forms of civil disobedience to bring attention to the issue, which I think is important, um, but to be heard by government. Finally, at the end of, 2018, which had actually is the same time that I was contacted by uh, Elliot Page, you know, that Christmas 2018, our government said, we are finally going to close that mill that has been dumping effluent into Boat Harbor since 1967. We can no longer make broken promises to this community. We've given the industry owner ample time to come back to us with a robust environmental assessment. They've had five years to do that. They didn't do it. No more excuses. We are closing it. This is a week of Christmas 20, sorry, week of Christmas 2019. 
And he said, January 31st, 2020, the mill will close. January 31st, 2020, the mill did close. This is a huge victory. I don't know if I can point to any other victory in Canada, but this is a community that has been fighting for those. They did it without weapons, um, but they did it in the traditional way and they won. Now, everything is not perfect. There's still cleanup to do after all of those years. And the community is kind of, you know, saying right now that they have concerns about the cleanup. But this is a major victory. So it can be done. It's slow going. I think the topic of environmental racism is extremely difficult to address. I've become aware of that doing this project that it's about capital accumulation and profit. Of course, this is making money for the Canadian government, right? So this is the reason why it's so difficult in any country. It's difficult to address this issue because government is making money. It's about profit. So the fact that this community could have that type of achievement is fantastic. Yes, it took over 40 years, not good, but it's a victory nevertheless, without guns and we or weapons of any kind. Okay, so the next question was posted in the chat and it says, um, why does the climate crisis affect women more than it does men? Good question. Uh, a lot of that has to do with uh, the social construction of gender. So sex, we would say often is real. It's based on biology. And we would say often that gender is a social construction, just like race is a social construction. It doesn't make it less real. It has real implications on the ground, but gender is a social construction. So if gender is a social construction, it means that we have certain expectations and roles in our society for women versus men. And the, that could be roles in the household, uh, roles in society and roles in the workplace. So when I think, for example, of women in developing countries, I would often say that they are most vulnerable, uh, poor women in developing countries because women in many developing countries are responsible, as you know, for collecting water, um, for preparing the home, for finding food, uh, for collecting wood, right? So that's their role. You think of many African countries and that's the role of women. They're outside, um, vulnerable to climate change because of the role that they have in society and in their, their home. Um, and they're also, in many cases, poor, right? De depending on the country. So those types of vulnerabilities, the social construction of gender, the social positioning of women, the roles that they have in the home, the workplace, in society, will put them at risk in very different, it doesn't mean that men aren't at risk, men are at risk in different ways as well, right? So when I talk about, for example, the body, I mentioned in my, in my uh, presentation that the bodies of indigenous and black women are vulnerable with respect to reproductive health issues, that's the unique way in which they are vulnerable, I'm talking about biology and I'm talking about sex, right? The, the sex and gender to a certain extent. Men are also vulnerable, right? So when we think of the kinds of work that men do, men are disproportionately working outdoors, right? In, in Canadian society, they're building houses and condos and there, and you see, certainly you see women outdoors now more and more, but men are disproportionately located in certain types of jobs, making them vulnerable in very different ways uh, to climate change. Even when I think of pollutants, right, in terms of where you work, I think of immigrant women who come to Canada. Immigrant racialized women are disproportionately located in uh, hotels, cleaning your hotel rooms, uh, cleaning in hospitals. The kinds of pollutants that they are working with, that they're cleaning with, will put them at a particular risk. So I would say that the racialized, low-income immigrant women who are working in job ghettos like cleaning your hotel room and cleaning hospitals are also disproportionately exposed to, to pollutants in very specific ways. So I think with climate change, when we think of gender, we have to think of gender roles. We have to think of poverty. I talked earlier about being poor means that you are less prepared, less equipped, living in communities or areas where you don't have access to certain resources to ward off or to fight off climate change impacts. And then also when it hits, for example, in um, uh, a develop, developing country, when it hits, you once again don't have the resources, the cloud, political, economic, social cloud and resources to then come back from that. 
right? So women are, as we know, in terms of our socioeconomic political hierarchy, are at the bottom of the rung, right? Women are at the bottom of the rung. Poor women are at the utmost bottom of the rung. So once again, you do those intersections. So it's not just women. You have to think about women, but you also have to intersect that with social class, um, income insecurity. You have to do all of those intersections because women is a very essentialist category. And when you complicate it with other social identities, you will find that certain women are even more exposed to climate change impacts than others when you do those intersections. I hope that explains it. Thank you very much. Um, Micha. Yeah, um, so we were talking earlier about the issue of uh, gentrification or urban renewal, as you said. And you also said that we need political action. And I was wondering, could you please explain what, which policy would you pass to, like on a political level, to stop gentrification or to improve gentrification? So what can be done? I don't think it would be dissimilar from environmental racism. Um, since I've been, if I'm thinking of Halifax and the North End, I don't recall there ever being a policy around gentrification. The African Nova Scotian community has fought back, however, right? But have felt that they haven't been heard. And actually it's something that is just happening. And I, and to be honest, I don't think it's something that can be stopped. The community is different. When I go to the North End, it's very rare that I see a black person as I did when I moved to Halifax in 2008, I saw it as a black community. Now it's a mixed community, it has happened. And I think in terms of gentrification in the North End, it's not too late. Um, that doesn't mean that the community hasn't fought back. The community has attended meetings with um, condo owners and business people and policymakers and people in planning and the Department of Planning, HRM, Halifax Planning, and to no avail. And they would say that consultations have never been done well with their community. Um, and th that's because planners typically actually don't want things to change. You know, I speak, I speak with planners, I speak with planning students and I say, do planners really want things to change though? You talk about doing consultations with community members, but planners have an idea in their head of how they want things. And you don't really, really want to do those consultations because it means that You're going to have to change something. When you listen to an African Nova Scotian say, well, we don't want this and we don't want that, it means you're going to actually have to listen and you might have to do something. And is that really what you want to do? And I've had many planning people tell me, I, actually, you're right, Ingrid. No, we don't want to make those changes. So their, their consultations have been non-inclusive and not culturally specific. I think with the issue of gentrification in Halifax, I think, I hate to say it, but the ship has sailed. If you go to the North End now, it's mostly white. It, now it's a community of upper middle class, lawyers, uh, business people, high rise condos, expensive restaurants, the ship has sailed. So if I were to do a policy, it would be very similar to, it would be similar to what I did with environmental racism, but I would also get somebody who's a cheerleader. Um, The whole issue with environmental racism and the bill is because I found Lenore Zan. I found a politician who has been a cheerleader. And I don't think it's a, you're able to have success around a bill if you don't find that one politician who is persistent and consistent. She has been persistent and consistent. I've met her in 2015 and with her and I continue to collaborate. And she is determined and she's a cheerleader. So I think... Perhaps the African Nova Scotian community never found, I don't know, never found that chair leader, never pursued um, a private member's bill. I don't recall one ever being developed. But I don't think a bill is the end all and be all. I just don't. I think, you know, what I've learned in my project, I used to think the bill was everything, but I don't anymore. What I've learned with my project is that everything that I shared with you earlier, whether it's the educational curriculum, you know, doing public engagement events, developing a bill, uh, water testing. I think there's a different way to enter these issues and they're all the right way and there isn't one way and the bill isn't the only way. 
And it has to be able to mobilize. Ultimately, it's about community. If the community isn't mobilized, nothing will happen. And community forces change, right? The communities force change. Politicians will not do anything unless there's screaming and rowdiness from community people, the public. And Lenore told me that. She said, Ingrid, if the community doesn't rise up, this bill will never get passed. Because I asked her, I said, why do you keep introducing this bill over those years, right? Bill 111. I said, you keep introducing it, but I don't really see the point of it. She said, well, no, it, nothing will ever happen if the community isn't mobilized. So what I find in Canada is that you get mobilizing and then people get frustrated. They get tired because nothing happens. And then it kind, it kind of just dissipates. And I know it's difficult to keep up the energy, but th there needs to be consistency. And probably that's around the world, right? It's like everybody gets angry, they get mobilized, there's petition signings, and then everything stops. And then they mobilize again. And, and it just doesn't work. People have to, you have to find ways to keep it up, right? Or else politicians don't take it seriously. So I think that, I think in terms of gentrification, I think you've got an African Nova Scotian community that wasn't heard, consultations weren't done. Um, they continue to try, they continue to talk about gentrification, but I kind of feel like the ship has sailed. I hate to say it because the face of the North End is completely changed from 10 years ago when I came. I would never consider it to be a black community anymore. And I, that's what it was. It's considered to be a historic black community. I would never see it that way now because it's just not historically. Yes, but currently no. Thank you very much. So um, the time is almost up. There's like two more minutes left. And yeah, I, I, have, I just want to say that I have another meeting right now. Yeah, okay. So but we I should call this. If there's a short question or comment, I could, yeah. Okay, there's a, I don't know if, if the answer is short. The question is pretty long. Um, oh. it, it was just posted in the chat. If you want, I can, I can quickly read it to you. And you can see if you can just get, give a really short answer. Um, it says, as for your mention of embodying the rights of nature in the legal constitution, indigenous groups in the middle and south of Africa, for example, Ecuador, are fighting for this topic, legal rights of the health of nature, and somewhere succeeded in embodying such rights in the national constitution. Do you know about cooperations of indigenous groups in the north with those in the south? I'm not too clear on the question, but I am aware that isn't that something that is also being looked at in New Zealand? Um, there is a policy called UNDRIP in the United Nations Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous People. So I'm aware of that topic with respect to the United Nations Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous People, which is looking at making the environment, is, is he saying a human element? Like humanizing the environment? Mm -hmm. And I believe that that has been done or being done or looked at in New Zealand. Um, so I'm aware of it. It's in, the, it's in UNDRIP, um, but I don't know enough about it. Um, it could be a possibility because UNDRIP was actually um, approved in Vancouver Canada, I think three weeks ago. So I can't say too much about it, but I'm aware of the conversation and it's in line with indigenous epistemology, as I mentioned earlier, right? In your Western understandings, we see these things as separate in indigenous epistemology, they see, they see everything as connected and holistic. Um, so the water, the land, the body, the spirit, the psychic elements are all interconnected issues. So I think as an aspect of indigenous traditional ecological knowledge, it makes sense. And I think it needs to inform environmental assessments. Environmental assessments, as you know, is the tool that's used to decide where a particular industry goes. And I think as long as we have environmental assessments that are informed by Euro Western understanding, then it's always going to be a problem until we start to look at other epistemologies and understandings, particularly those of Indigenous people and how they see the world. Uh, then we can do right or we can make more considered decisions. You know, people always say to me, well, where are you going to put the landfilling grid? In our community? And I always say, well, why is it always in the Indigenous community? It's like when you say our community, you mean the white community, but 
you know, so I don't know where they should put it. That's not my job. I'm not an expert in this, but I'm, I'm just saying that people need to make considered decisions. And those considered decisions is about looking at other people's ways of knowing, the indigenous ways of knowing. It is their land, right? And they have a very different understanding of the world. So hopefully that kind of answers your question. <laughs> Thank you very, very much again from all of us, from Students for Future Hildesheim, and I think also from everyone who was listening in today. And um, yeah, it was really nice to have you in our lecture series. Thank you so much. That was a really nice, huge uh, crowd. Yeah. Um, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. Have a good day. Have good questions. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Okay. And so, okay, ähm, dann mache ich jetzt mal wieder zurück auf Deutsch, denn bevor ich das Meeting beende, noch eine kurze Ankündigung, beziehungsweise einfach der Ausblick für nächste Woche, steht auf dem Programm äh, der Vortrag mit dem Titel Decolonizing Climate Activism äh, von Mitzi Junel Tan, einer Klimaaktivistin aus den Philippinen. Das heißt, jetzt nachdem wir Frau Waldron aus Kanada gehört haben, geht es dann weiter mit einer aktivistischen Perspektive von den Philippinen. Mit sie ist bei Fridays for Future und bei anderen Klimagerechtigkeitsorganisationen aktiv und ähm, ja, wird diesen spannenden Vortrag halten am nächsten Dienstag um 18 Uhr auf Zoom. Und es wird auch wieder eine deutsche simultane Übersetzung geben, so wie heute. Genau, ansonsten findet ihr unter dem Link äh, die Inf nähere Infos zum Vortrag sowie auch das weitere Programm darüber hinaus. Und ähm, nochmal der kurze Hinweis, wir bieten morgen um 19 Uhr, also zu unserer normalen Plenumszeit, ein Kennenlernplenum an, äh, das allen, die interessiert sind, eventuell bei uns mitzumachen, den Einstieg erleichtern soll in unseren aktuell vorrangig digitalen Aktivismus. Ansonsten ähm, bleibt mir sozusagen danke an alle, die wieder hier waren. Wir freuen uns, dass es erneut so viele Menschen waren, ähm, wie schon letzte Woche und hoffen, dass das so bleibt über die nächsten Wochen. Ähm, genau, und sind schon ganz gespannt auf den nächsten Vortrag. Und ich wünsche allen noch einen schönen Abend. <lacht>